Highclere Castle, world famous as the location for hit drama series Downton Abbey. Over centuries, it's played host to royalty, nobility, and celebrity. It holds unexpected secrets. This is a fairy tale castle with a real life lord and lady, even a real life butler. I think it's very important to maintain standards because once they disappear, they will never come back. This is the behind the scenes story of England's best known country home. Seventy miles west of London lies one of the great estates of England, Highclere. A country house nestling in 5,000 acres. That's five times the size of New York's Central Park. Highclere is the location backdrop for the successful television period drama Downton Abbey. And walking through its doors is like walking onto the television set. In reality, this is a 19th century trophy house designed to show off inherited wealth and far more than just a fictional creation. For Highclere is also a family home for a real lord and lady. The Carnarvon family have lived here for 300 years. Their links with Highclere go back even further. The family have owned the land here since the um, time of Charles II's um, reign in the late um, 1600. George Herbert, the eighth Earl of Carnarvon, inherited his title and the keys to the castle in 2001, just two years after marrying former accountant Fiona Aitken, the present day Lady Carnarvon. Good afternoon, my lord. Good afternoon, my lady. I met my husband at the end of 96. I first came in January 97. But you don't know when you turn up you're going to end up marrying. <laughs> you're just a guest. <laughs> and um, I came for a shooting party and we then were together for a couple of years before we got married. Lady Carnarvon married into a classic English fairy tale life, complete with servants, because an estate like Highclere doesn't run itself. Oh, how wonderful. Dunk, actually, then I'd be really happy. Back in the castle's heyday, an army of 60 servants attended to the Lord and Lady's every whim. Thank you very much indeed. Today, there's around 20 full-time staff helping manage this historic estate. Our role is really that, is, is, is that we're long-term stewards of, of the estate for the next generation of the castle and the estate, uh, leaving it for the future generations to enjoy, really. Highclere costs a cool $1 million a year to maintain. So cashing in on Downton's television fame is an invaluable boost to Lord and Lady Carnarvon's income. We really have to do our best to make the whole place earn its living and pay its way and add value where possible. And of course, you can't really get any greater value added than, than finding Downton Abbey being shot at Highclere itself, which adds value, in fact, to all the enterprises here, in all honesty, because it's really put Highclere on the map. That map attracts 60,000 visitors a year. Most are Downton fanatics so enthusiastic and they turn up here and get so excited there's a real oral encounter it's great it's fantastic and and they've chosen to come here it's been an extraordinary experience millions of television viewers now know and love every corner of lord and lady carnarvon's home downton scriptwriter julian fellows is a friend of the family he had highclere in mind as he wrote the hit drama with a starring role for rooms such as the elegant library. It's the setting for frequent meetings between the fictional Earl of Grantham and his equally fictitious butler. They discuss the fictitious running of their fictitious house. In reality, it was used in the late 19th century by the fourth Earl of Carnarvon as his withdrawing room. I prefer just because it's quite a girly room when you're dressed up and relaxing at the beginning of an evening heaven. And Julian and the fellows may stay. They would also come down and 
um, join us for drinks here. And obviously in Downton Abbey as well, it's used by the supposed Grantham family and Maggie Smith and Cora. Elizabeth McGovern sit here for their tete -tet, So in the third series, there seems to be a few tete -tet between Shirley MacLaine and Maggie Smith. Things in the house have been passed down the generations as family heirlooms. The children of the first Earl of Carnarvon hang over the fireplace. In pride of place is Lady Carnarvon's pride and joy, a 19th century family heirloom. And I moved it here into the drawing room. It was jolly heavy and quite a kerfuffle. Got some professional piano movers in to do it, obviously, but it is wonderful. It's an original Steinway from 1895. It has a beautiful tone. Quite fun to put photographs on it. And some of the music here is my modern, very simple music. <laughs> some of it is much more complicated pieces, which were obviously played by predecessors here. The drawing room has changed little through the years. It and other rooms are perhaps the real stars of the Downton drama. It is a very beautiful house and it seems to never... It never fluffs its lines, does it, in Downton? It always looks great. And the cameramen find different shots of the library or the dining room or the views maybe from the tower or maybe up to the towers. It's amazing that your house somehow is, is being so much part of a story. I sometimes see views of the rooms from an angle that I don't normally appreciate. I think, hold on, where, where exactly is that? Where are they? A priceless Van Dyke. But there's one secret room you'll never see in Downton Abbey. The smoking an English manor house tradition from the late 18th century onwards. This room was a male preserve for smoking, gaming, and important men's talk away from the ladies. It also saved the women from instant asphyxiation. There was a smoking room for two reasons then, because this chimney didn't work too well, so there's a lot of smoke in the room. But in fact, um, nowadays, we don't, we don't use this fire any, any, anymore. And some of this room has been restored in, in some ways. It's one of my favorites, though, because it has these absolutely beautiful paintings in it, this glorious colours of, of this still life of the different types of birds and the paradise landscape by a Dutch painter called Jan Vanix. In private place is a photo of the current Earl's grandfather, a colourful character with a party reputation. This is one of his wives, the famous dancer Tilly Losh. My grandfather, um, he loved this room, and he loved being in these leather chairs here. In fact, he spent much of his life around, around this part of, of, of the castle. Highclere may be a castle today, but once, like this. In 1839, architect Charles Barry is brought in, fresh from designing London's Houses of Parliament. He remodels Highclere in a matching Gothic revival style, a clear homage to the British seat of government. It turns what had been an unremarkable home into a far grander status symbol, and Highclere House transforms into the freshly minted Highclere Castle. Even earlier, the Parklands too had their own makeover. The most fashionable landscape gardener of his age, Lancelot Capability Brown, swept away the earlier formal gardens. Instead, he opened up Highclere to the beauty of the English countryside and a peculiarly English tradition of creating the oddest of ornamental buildings. These fanciful structures, known as follies, were designed by family member Robert Herbert, inspired by classical ruins during the grand tour of Europe, de rigueur for young bucks of his day. I'm really in so much in debt from Robert Herbert's vision in the 18th century. Without that kind of vision, we wouldn't be enjoying so much today. To the south of the castle, Heaven's Gate, built in 1737. A pillared temple called Jackdaw's Castle, built in 1743. And to the northeast, overlooking Dunsmere Lake, the romantic but utterly pointless Temple of Diana. Everything about the sprawling five... The mile-long drive to the house winds its way past 56 cedars of Lebanon, planted by the first Earl of Carnarvon over three centuries ago. Such planning takes time. 
Well, we're just um, coming into the main part of Lime Avenue, where most of these lime linden trees were planted at the time of my grandfather's birth in 1899, and most of them are still going strong today. Despite this tradition of planting for the future, not even an historic estate like Highclere can survive unchanged. Ever-rising maintenance costs and taxes have chipped away at the landholding. Like many estates, it has lost some land. It was perhaps a bit 20% bigger then, but much of it is still intact today. Another intact, though much changed tradition involves the human face of the Highclere estate. For 300 years, the privileged Carnarvons have been looked after by faithful servants. Today, they still employ a butler. In the past, he'd been known as Mr. Edwards. These days, it's just Colin. This is a job that you dress up, you look smart, you feel good. And if you feel good, you can do your job better, I think. The role of the butler nowadays has differs quite enormously from what it was in Downton's days. In those days, they looked purely after the, uh, the family. No, I think in the Downton era, it would have been completely different. I'm quite envious of Carson. Today, it's all about multitasking. In the summer, Colin also works in the visitor's ticket office when he's not looking after the family. The Highclere Butler's role may have changed over the years, but that doesn't stop Colin from ensuring standards remain. The tables have been laid this way for hundreds of years in these type of houses, something that doesn't change. If it does change, it just doesn't look right. I think it's very important to maintain standards because once they disappear, they will never come back. Colin takes his job seriously. It's become part of his identity, even at home. Oh yes, every breakfast, um, we always lay this way at home. Um, sort of, my wife is in the kitchen preparing and I lay the table. So how did Colin rate his Downton alter ego? When you see Mr. Carson laying the table, he's He's learnt very quickly how it should be done, and uh, I think I would employ him. Just like the fictional Carson, Colin has to take care of a variety of VIP guests. The Queen, Prince Philip were regular visitors. Uh, Prince Harry's been here, uh, film stars. They're normal people. But, uh, we treat them as everyone else. As an earl, Lord Carnarvon is part of the British aristocracy, just one down from a duke who holds pole position. The higher up the hierarchy, the more likely you are to have a royal visit. And that means you have to keep the house in good order so that it's fit for a visit from the queen. Two floors alone and four main stairwells. Housekeeping is a never-ending chore. Just cleaning and polishing all 356 pieces of this crystal chandelier takes two days. A hundred years ago, the aristocrats that lived upstairs at Highclere were looked after by a host of staff who worked downstairs. Maids, butlers, valets, footmen, gardeners, gatekeepers and grooms all made sure that the castle ran like clockwork. And woe betide any servant disobeying strict codes of conduct. Maids cleaned in the early hours of the morning to avoid disturbing their sleeping lord and lady. Servants must neither be seen nor heard. Cheap labor provided no motive for labor-saving devices. Everything was done by hand. Electricity came early to Highclere. In the 19th century, only the wealthy could afford it and new high-tech devices proved handy for summoning the servants. What we have here is the bell board, which every room virtually in the castle has a button in each room which is connected to all the different little bells there. And if someone presses them, the centre then starts 
waggling and you can tell which room has called you. The bellboard saved servants the bother of lurking outside a room to see if they were needed, but only if they could get on more efficiently with work downstairs. A few other state-of-the-art household aids have survived the centuries. High in the tower is where unmarried maids once slept, once strictly off-limits to young male footmen, now equally off-limits to tourists visiting the castle. Three maids shared each tiny room, never far from the call of duty. The only high-tech appliance here was to help in case of fire. The ground is a long way down, so a canvas escape chute could be hung from the window. Maids were taught to keep arms close to bodies, otherwise delicate elbows might catch in the metal hoops. Complementing the inside staff are ground staff looking after the estate. This has been a playground for deer since medieval times. But to protect the vegetation, their numbers have to be kept under control. And so it takes one man and his gun. In the office, they call me Robert Hawker, the deer stalker, because it rhymes. <laughs> estate for seven years. Maintaining a healthy population means culling the weaker animals. On the estate, we have three species of deer. We have the muntjac, the roe and the fallow. They're such beautiful animals and, and you know, um, I, my job here is just to make sure that they flourish. You've got to feel always I believe to be a true sportsman and be able to do this sort of thing, you've got to feel remorse for what you've just done. The little hair there, tucked up under the rain. Um, you've got to feel remorse for what you've done, otherwise you just become a killing machine. Um, and you need to feel that. It's a, it's a lovely animal that we've culled. Just before dark a lot of stuff moves in that last 15 minutes of daylight that's when the possibilities go up higher for a shot but maybe not this time Robert didn't get to pull the trigger tonight his deer have a lucky escape the staff room Eddie recalls High Clear's golden era in the old days there, it was all private. Lord Carnarvon had his guests, like, he'd um, invite all, more or less, his old school friends all through the winter, and he'd, they'd shoot with one another. The Prince of Wales, the future King Edward VII, came to shoot here in the 1890s. That's the French with his two loaders and the cartridge boy, which was taken around about 1904, I think. They shot. 1,600 pheasants here in three quarters of an hour. Luckily for the pheasants, times have changed. You can't run a shoot now, not with the cost of things now. You just couldn't do it. Today, people do still come here to shoot, but as one of the estate's many business opportunities, and the visitors are more likely to be rich businessmen. Morning, Tom. Morning, Ed. Shoot went well yesterday, didn't it? Yeah, it was a good day. Plenty of birds about. They all go like that, we'll be all yeah, we will. Eddie is assisted by his young underkeeper, Tom. Yeah, yeah, Ed's a very good boss. Um, he's fair, although he can be strict. <laughs> it's early days in Tom's career, but like many of the staff on the estate, he expects to be here for life. I've been on High Clear Estate as a gamekeeper for the past three seasons, um, although I did help out and do my work experience and also helped out through school here. Yeah. Probably a bit too. to help. Morning, Paul. Good morning, Eddie. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Fantastic. Good morning. Thank you. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. This pheasant is destined for a mushroom risotto, a dish cooked in this kitchen for more than 100 years. Lovely. Fantastic. All right. 
Pheasants would have been eaten here 100 years ago. You know, they're on the land, it's something they can uh, graze off of. It's very yeah, it's, uh, it's part of their stable diet. 100 years ago, they would have eaten these on the bone. It's a far superior way of cooking the meat because it stays nice and moist. It was also a golden age for British food, giving birth to celebrity chef, exotic new dishes, and gargantuan 12-course meals. Aristocrats poached their dishes and their chefs from across the globe. Many ingredients came from the continent. Risotto, 1574, found in Milan. Um, chefs travelled. You know, good houses went on holidays, they found a good cook in the country, and they brought one back. The fifth Earl brought his chef back from Sri Lanka. His recipe for chicken curry is still a favourite on the High Clear menu today. A typical society dinner menu for a party of 20 people cost around $100, double a maid's entire annual salary. Country estates were playgrounds for the rich and famous, and Highclere joined in with gusto. December 1895, the Prince of Wales, the future King Edward VII, arrived at Highclere for the most extravagant weekend the castle had ever seen. For His Royal Highness, nothing was too much money, or too extravagant. There were 12 courses at dinner, caviar, Truffles, snipe, partridge, oysters, quail, ptarmigan, pressed beef, chicken, galantines, and pineapple. With a full belly, the king retired to his room, refurbished for his visit, with red silk walls and ornate French furniture. In today's money, the bill for three days entertaining royalty was an eye watering $500,000. What do you need? I think 100 years ago when you know, Lord and Lady Carvin or any Lord or any lady in a house in England were, were entertaining, they wanted to be the best, they had to be the best. It was about being top of the tree and having the finest ingredients, you know, being lobster, a bit of fillet of beef, a bit of venison. I think today, um, under our Lord and Lady Carvin, we're a lot more cost aware. You know, it's, we are a business, we do need to make money, um, but the families still live well. And the current Lady Carvin is still very particular about the cooking. Lady Carnarvon and I have had many conversations over the apple charlotte recipe. It's um, something I love to make with brioche and, and, and golden delicious apples. However, I don't think Lady Carnarvon's nanny made it the same way, so we're, we're still fighting to uh, come up with the perfect recipe ready for Lady Carnarvon. Highclere is a spectacular house with a rich and exotic past. But the most extraordinary chapter in its 300-year-old history began in 1890, when the present Lord Carnarvon's fifth earl ran up huge debts and Highclere was facing potential ruin. But the Earl had a solution. He married a teenage heiress, Almina Wombwell, daughter of banking giant Alfred de Rothschild. A hundred years ago, an extraordinary woman called Almina lived here. She was an heiress, and unlike the character Corin Downton Abbey, she was an heiress with that wonderful thing called cash and it was her own cash. It wasn't entailed, it wasn't tied up. She was a tremendously wealthy woman. As part of the marriage settlement, de Rothschild paid $200,000 to cover the Earl's debts and provided Almina with a dowry of $800,000. Almina's fabulous wealth ensured the flag continued to fly over Highclere and her mark on the castle survives today. This is a silk wall covering here, which was uh, given as a present to Lady Almina by her father, Alfred de Rothschild, just over 100 years ago now. And she gave her enough silk both for the wall covering and the curtains. In original form, it would have cost thousands of dollars. Nothing was too much for Almina and her insatiable appetite for the good life. She loved wearing jewels and dancing. She was just barely five foot, very trim figure, loved the best clothes, the best jewels. Not only rich, but also the wife of an earl. Unsurprisingly, Almina was a popular society hostess. Her party seemed often to start at 10 o'clock at night when everyone would draw up, and the house was one of the first in the area to be electrified, to have electricity. And they would dance till 6 in the morning. Carnarvon might come downstairs and say a few words, and then he would retreat back up to his sitting room and probably carry on reading or whatever else. 
In fact, Carnarvon was working on something big. Something so big that it would bring worldwide fame to Highclere. This was the Lord Carnarvon, who bankrolled the discovery and excavation of Tutankhamun's tomb. The story of how the Earl helped make such an extraordinary discovery began with his passion for automobiles. My great-grandfather was fascinated by the new technology of the early motor cars, the engines and designs, and he was one of the first people to import the really earliest cars. I think he became quite keen on becoming a bit of a speedster and driving rather fast, because he did have some fairly spectacular accidents. There's one in Germany where he turned the whole thing over and broke a whole bunch of bones around his, uh, even his jaw, upper body, it was nursed for health by my amazing great-grandmother, Armina. The accident left and not be in the humid, cold climate of England, which is one of the reasons why he started going out to Egypt. And there, in Egypt, Carnarvon developed a passion for ancient relics. Deep down in Highclere's cellars are replicas of the contents of a pharaoh's tomb. Created by the modern-day Earl, this memorial to his great-grandfather includes one of the most recognizable images in the world, the golden mask of the boy king, Tutankhamun. Really, my great-grandfather was a man on a quest. He was absolutely fascinated by objects of, of great antiquity and, and great beauty, and he really wanted to find something that really hadn't been found before. The Earl used his wife's fortune to fund the archaeologist Howard Carter as he searched the Valley of the Kings. Several years, and thousands upon thousands of dollars later, they made history. Of course, they made the, the fateful uh, discovery end of October, November 1922, when one of the workmen found those now famous steps down to the rock-cut tomb. Lord Carnarvon was beside Carter as he chiselled the first hole in the sealed entrance. Carnarvon asked, can you see anything? Carter replied with the famous words, yes, wonderful things. And of course, they came away with the greatest archaeological discovery and archaeological prize that's ever been, really. The discovery made headlines all around the world and put Highclere on the map. Highclere was completely a, became part of a global event with the, with the discovery of the tomb. There was the, the first Pathé News cine film and all that kind of thing. It went right around the world, and everyone wanted an interview with, with Lord Carnarvon. But just at his moment of greatest triumph, disaster struck. Resting on the banks of the Nile, the Earl was bitten by a mosquito. Just four months after the spectacular discovery, Lord Carnarvon died from the effects of septicemia. Newspapers around the world blamed the tragedy on a curse from the tomb. And the hype intensified after a bizarre coincidence. As the Earl passed away in Egypt, his dog Susie, back at Highclere, howled and died at the exact same instant. The current Earl celebrates his great-grandfather's discovery with these reproductions in the basement. But upstairs at Highclere, there is genuine Egyptian treasure. In 1988, one of the castles carefully one of the really fascinating secrets of the smoking room are these extraordinary cupboards hidden here between the drawing room behind me and the smoking room, which, during my grandfather's life, lay undisturbed and undiscovered for some 62 years. And we never knew anything about it. And my grandfather was superstitious and never said anything. So after he died, my father and his butler, Robert Taylor, were looking at all the different things in the castle. And Robert says to my father, well, my lord, there might be some Egyptian stuff. And my father says, well, I don't believe that. There just can't be any took him here and they pulled out the furniture apart and went in here and there are these extraordinary objects. Unknown to us, after my great-grandfather died, Howard Carter had sent most of the collection of my great-grandfather, the wonderful Egyptian collection, to New York, the Metropolitan Museum, but a few items he left at Highclere and they were hidden in these cupboards. And you can still see today the old um, tobacco-type packets and tins with Cairo on them and that kind of thing, and jewellery boxes, and little makeup pots from the time of the Lady Pharaoh, Hatshepsut, they were all stored and this cupboard here and the one on the other side as well. So these houses give up secrets in strange places and we have a connection with 
three or four thousand years into the past of ancient Egypt. But that connection is bittersweet, leading to the death of one of the family's most enterprising earls. So we're now en route, slowly heading up Beacon Hill to see the grave of my great-grandfather. And of course, his grave lies at over 800 feet above sea level at the summit of Beacon Hill, which is an ancient uh, Iron Age fort and has spectacular views in all directions. The Earl's body was brought back from Egypt and laid to rest at this, the highest point on the High Clear estate. We're right by the grave of my great-grandfather, uh, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. He was one of the, perhaps the last great eccentric, even maverick, adventurers. And he wanted to be buried high up on his estate, looking back to his glorious house, the castle. And maybe he also thought that he was buried in a quiet, desolate spot, like the extraordinary ancient pharaoh Tutankhamun, that he, whose tomb he discovered. It's always rather poignant coming back up here, looking at his grave. It just makes one think of past ancestors and what they did, really. The fifth earl has been written into the history books, forever linking the family name Carnarvon with one of the most extraordinary discoveries of all time. Almina also had a moment of glory, but hers had come a few years earlier. August 4th, 1914, at the height of a long, hot summer, war lives and learn to fight. Life at High Clear, above and below stairs, changed forever. 75 men left the estate for the battlefields to fight what would be a bloody war. Some of the grooms were the first to enlist because they could obviously ride, and at the time, we thought the cavalry was an important part of a battle plan. The keepers joined the machine gunner corps, and then some of the gardeners. The aptly named Digweed family had gardened at Highclere for generations. Their oldest son, George, enlisted with two other gardeners, Albert Young and Charlie Adams. Though the head gardener, Pope, stayed behind to grow food for the estate. Yet the upstairs side of Highclere also made sacrifices. Society girl Almina set aside her life of privilege to care for wounded army officers. She had decided that she wanted to turn this house into hospital. Almina organised doctors and surgeons and hired 30 nurses. Highclere was transformed into a makeshift hospital for hundreds of men. Blinds were fitted to all the south-facing windows to offer shade for her patients. The journey home from the front wasn't easy, but the ones who survived were met at the door by Lady Almina. She welcomed the first 30-odd patients in September 1914. As the officers began to arrive, the enormity of the situation became apparent. Two-thirds had injuries to bones from shrapnel and gunshot wounds. So the resourceful Almina adapted her plans. She turned part of Highclere into an operating theatre.
So this is Arundel bedroom, which um, is one of my favourite bedrooms to put guests in today. But um, 100 years ago, it was used by Almina as her operating theatre in the First World War. I imagine it's because it was near the stone staircase, which could be used by the staff. And this was where, apparently, there used to be operations every Monday when the surgeons would come down by train from London. It was the orthopaedic injuries, the broken legs, the broken arms, the broken hands, which were sent back across the water to England. So many of them had not merely a, a bus leg or bullets in their calf, but also gangrene and dysentery. So Almina was faced with some quite tough cases. While the officers were convalescing, Almina spared no expense to make them comfortable. Silver service dinners were followed by cards in the library. Highclere was a haven for the wounded. In the archives are hundreds of letters from grateful patients and families, testimony to the work of Almina. I was indeed lucky to be sent to Highclere and shall never forget all your kindness. I arrived feeling an awful wreck and so depressed that I didn't care whether I lived or died. But your sympathy for me and the fact that you stayed with me that first night worked a most wonderful cure. My heart feels too full for me to express the deep gratitude I feel for you, for all you've done for me. Oh, I cannot tell you what a joy it is to be able to do so much already, and my heart feels too full for me to express the deep gratitude I feel to you. Some of the letters are moving because they're obviously written by a right-handed man in his left hand, learning to write from scratch, because he'd lost his right hand. But um, she was an extraordinary woman. She had the money, and if she didn't have the money, she would still have on such a scale and just go for it. What a lot we owe to people who came before us. The war claimed millions of lives, wiping out entire estates and whole family lines. Half of the men sent off to war were dead, wounded or missing, including 13 men from Highclere. Among them, Gardeners George Digweed and Charlie Adams were taken prisoner and died in captivity, while Albert Young was killed in action. The end of the war brought massive social and political change and heralded a new era in England. Men who left as servants returned as less deferential, battle-hardened veterans, demanding social equality. A British economy ruined by war demanded new taxes. A shock to the landed gentry, used to income tax at 6%. By the time Lloyd George had his budget right at the end of the first war, it was more like 50-60. So we weren't really expecting these kind of things with the higher incomes, and a lot of them didn't prepare for it very well. <laughs> and so they just kept spending money and they didn't think of it with tax. And then things were sold. A lot of estates began to be broken up. Everyone was struggling to make ends meet. Um, the New World, America, was where the money was, and art was being sold from this country to America to fund the gap and for the um, families in this country to pay their tax because their revenue from land and farming was fallen off a cliff. There was very little. The landed gentry could no longer afford large numbers of servants, and a generation educated by war saw greater opportunities in factories, trade and cities. So many aristocratic families simply gave up. In the 1950s and 60s, many British country houses were demolished. Against all the odds, Highclere survived. The present Lord Carvin has taken on the challenge of preserving the best of the past. But it can be a daunting task. As Julian Phillips has said in the Downton script, you don't want to be the Earl that lets the whole thing down and it all goes and collapses, and, and that's the, the thing that, that really sort of hangs over one uh, a bit, um, because it's been discussed a number of times by Lord, Lord Grantham, and because uh, I feel sort of the same thing. Luckily, business is booming on the estate, and the Earl has been able to spend millions of dollars restoring the castle. Inside the house, the salon with its triple height vaulted ceiling and the, the roof above us now over two years, which was 
a few hundred thousand pounds, but we definitely had to do it, or we'd be very wet sitting here right now. It never really ends at High Clear. There's always something to be fixing, isn't there? So... Yes. I like doing the fun bits inside. <laughs> but if, without having good roofs and good walls, there's no point, you know, doing a, making it look beautiful again. As well as repairing the fabric of the house, there are other, more unusual costs. One man's folly is another man's maintenance project. Recently, all have been restored by the Earl. But everything we do here, whether it's fixing heritage, buildings like Follies, or, or even roofs and walls, it's all really for the, for the long term, it's not really a, a short term. To pay for the long term, Highclere has become a business, mixing old traditions with a new modern twist. The land around the castle is one of the last aristocrat-owned farming estates. The Highclere estate is around 5,000 acres. Uh, quite a bit of it is actually uh, grassland, rough pasture land like this downland we're on now, and also woodland. There's about 2,000 acres of arable land for farming, and we're uh, still growing wheat, barley, oats, and we also have about 1,600 ewes, and of course they're lambs as our sheep flock, because we have uh, around 1,400, 1,500 acres of grass to graze here, which is a fair amount on a state of this size. The family has farmed here for hundreds of years, an important source of income for generations. I think the basic um, tenants and skills of, of management of, of game and wildlife in general probably haven't changed so much. But like most farms today, it's had to diversify. Highclere is now famous for horse feed. They produce award-winning oats for racehorses, including the Queen's. These are the original stables, used for hundreds of years. But no racehorse is here, just Lady Carnarvon's Arab mare. Back in Almina's time, there were quite a few grooms, a head groom and a head coachman, under coachman, under grooms, stable boys to help. But today there is just one groom, Joe, to look after the animals. Hey, hey, come on. Don't panic, Mrs. Mellon, it's all right. They're very gentle animals. It's amazing. They've carried us for so many years, haven't they, across some fields and everywhere else. The car is such a recent invention, so they've been with us for thousands of years. And people have ridden around here for thousands of years. So I'm just trees. <laughs> Before cars took over the world, having the keys to a castle is a huge responsibility. I think we'd just about be able to get it to a state where the, the worst of the really big repairs have been done. That would mean, mean all, all the difference to me, really, to, to have achieved that in my lifetime. I can say that, hand over to my um, son George eventually and say, look, at least, you know, you, you, can, you can build on that. You're not having to go right back to square one with, with repairs that haven't been done for 150 years. Between them, Lord and Lady Carnarvon are preserving Highclere for future generations. I'm see my role as I'm trying to support his endeavours to, you know, not drop the bat on, to keep this, you know, to continue to live here and look after the landscape and the house and leave it in better nick um, than we inherited it in a way that is relevant in today's world. With its dedicated caretakers and newfound fame in Downton Abbey, Highclere Castle will remain one of the greatest states of England for some time to come.
Downton's scriptwriter Julian Fellows is a friend of the family. He had Highclere in mind as he wrote the hit drama, with a starring role for rooms such as the elegant library. It's the setting for frequent meetings between the fictional Earl of Grantham and his equally fictitious butler. They discuss the fictitious running of their fictitious house. In reality, it was used in the late 19th century by the fourth Earl of Carnarvon as his withdrawing room. At a girly room when you're dressed up and relaxing at the beginning of an evening heaven. And Julian Emma Fellows may stay. They would also come down and um, join us for drinks here. And obviously in Downton Abbey as well, it's used by the supposed Grantham family and Maggie Smith and Cora. Elizabeth McGovern sit here for their tete -tet, so or in the third series, there seems to be a few tete between Shirley MacLaine and Maggie Smith. Things in the house have been passed down the generations as family heirlooms. 